Okay, I can, can you guys actually hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. We've got um, about two minutes till we kick off. Um, you want to uh, follow along, you're welcome to. Uh, the slides will also be available after the presentation. And I put them in the comments on um, the uh, DrupalCon site if you just want to go there and click instead of typing all that in. And I don't promise it looks good on a phone. I didn't do responsive first. So. <laughs> Excuse me. Would you unmute the phone, please? Oh, sure. <laughs> We're doing some some fancy uh, recordings today. So. so we have one minute left, but um, can I get a show of hands of uh, who in here is a, a back-end developer? And who considers themselves uh, predominantly a front-end developer? Oh, awesome. Hi, guys. <laughs> My people. And um, anybody here from business, marketing, project management? Good, glad to see you here. Please know what we do, it's important. Ooh, it's time, okay. So hello everyone, um, hopefully you're in the right session, setting up a front-end development environment for Drupal 8. Um, I'm Kristen Bradham, I'm also known uh, through the Drupal community as K2, like the mountain, yes, or the character in the new Rogue One movie, K2SO. He's gonna come up later in the presentation. Um, why am I called K2? I'm K2 because I work very closely with um, another developer named Kristen, <laughs> and we got confused on day one. So uh, my name is Kristen Bradham, but I'm, I'm known through the Drupal community as K2. Um, if you would like to follow along, the slides are available um, on GitHub. This is a reveal uh, JS presentation, so you can look at it on your web browser. Um, uh, they're also, I put them in the comments on the uh, Drupal, Drupal uh, page. Um, we are getting uh, standing room only in the back, so those of you who maybe have a seat next to you, if you could scooch in a little bit, I would really, yeah, or raise your hand. Um, there are seats available, like I see a whole row right down the middle here that's not an aisle seat, sorry, we only have middles left, but um, if you would like to come forward and sit down, there are more spaces. I'm happy to see all you, you faces here. This is our, your first session. Who's, who's first DrupalCon? Anybody? Right on! Yes, <laughs> yes, woo, give me some hand, yay! <laughs> yes, thank you for coming to DrupalCon because uh, we have a lot of fun here and we need you here and we uh, love Drupal community and hopefully by the end of my talk I can also inspire you to um, come up and try to present next year or present at your local um, Drupal uh, user group or get involved in some way. Um, you know, my first Drupal camp was about four years ago and uh, I never thought I'd be standing up here, but here I am, so <laughs> we're gonna get at it. Um, I, uh, I work for a company called Hook42. You're gonna see us around here. Uh, we like to contribute by um, giving talks, so we're giving, I think, four or five um, talks here at DrupalCon uh, this year. Um, we've been um, doing uh, Drupal websites for about five years. We specialize in SEO, multilinguals, migrations, big old Drupal projects, and yes, Hook42, we like Douglas Adams. <laughs> That's where the name comes from. 42 is the answer to everything, so. Life, the universe, and everything, thank you. Um, about me, I kind of said before, my name is K2. Everybody knows me as K2. Little children call me K2. Uh, that's my name uh, everywhere that I am in the Drupalverse. Um, I am a site builder slash front-end developer slash I do everything and anything. We were, we're a small company, so 
If they need some help, I come out of the woodwork and help. Um, I've been doing web stuff forever. Uh, my talk today is going to be a lot about command line tools. <laughs> and as I like to joke with some of my younger colleagues, I remember when the command line was the computer. <laughs> so I've been uh, doing computer stuff since you know I was eight, and that was a lot of years ago. Um, and I don't say anymore because I just don't have to. <laughs> but I've been doing Drupal for almost five years. Um, I'm a couple months shy, but. Um, once I found Drupal, I really like this space. I really love the community. I love the support. I love the group. I love the people that I've met through this, um, uh, t this type of work. Um, I have three kids and two dogs. <laughs> if you want to talk to me later, I would love to talk to you about my kids and my dogs. If you have dogs, I will talk to you all day. I will probably remember your dog's name and will not remember your name. So. Um, why did I pick this subject? So boring, right? Hey, front-end environments for Drupal 8. So boring, yet all of us start here. We all have to do this. We have to get them in order. We have to get our environment in line before we can do any developing. So just to be very clear about what this talk is about, I don't do any development. I just set you up to do development in this talk. Um, the, the front end, has more command line tools now than the back end does. And this has been a major shift that we've seen in the last three to four years in um, front end development. The front end development has taken off. We now have all sorts of different um, uh, ops tools and we are working more and more on the command line. Um, it's, we have gone from front end being your graphic designer, your just CSS, I just know CSS and HTML, to really being full programmers who know a heck of a lot about JavaScript and need to organize ourselves because of it. Um, so we need a checklist. Like I have, every time I set up a new environment, I need a checklist because each client of mine, sometimes we're on Aquia, sometimes we're on Pantheon, sometimes we're somewhere else. It, each, it seems like every single time I try to set up my environment, I need to go through the checklist and um, make sure I am you may, setting up everything correctly. So this talk is as much for me as it is for you. I, I made myself a checklist. Um, so the first, things we're, the first thing we're going to do, uh, there's four major parts to the talk. Uh, we're going to talk about general environment setup, Drupal 8 setup. Then we're going to stretch. And yes, I am going to make you stand up. So be ready for that. I'm giving you fair warning. <laughs> uh, then we're going to do uh, front end DevOps, which is uh, your gulp and, and things like that. And then we're going to talk about um, one part of front end that's very um, debatable right now, and that's theme structures and how we're structuring our folders, our files, our selector names, all that. That's where uh, I'll get some people questioning me at the end on uh, what I think is best and what you think is best. So um, general environment setup. I'm going to go through this part pretty quick. Um, but here's my checklist for what do I have in my environment. I need to make sure I have my good editor, my hosting is set up, my MAMP WAMP set up, install Drupal, dev modules, permissions, bash shell, and git. So editors, this is pretty straightforward. Most of you probably have an editor that you prefer. I say if you like your editor, stay with your editor. I've moved to PHP Storm because for Drupal, I'm working in JavaScript, I'm working <laughs> in Twig, I'm working in PHP. Um, and PHP Storm uh, uh, supports all of that. But Coda and CodeKit, if you're straight front end, they have some serious advantages, and I do, um, I do recommend that you take a look at that. But more important than which editor is that you set up your editor for Drupal coding standards, okay? A lot of you raise your hand that this is your first DrupalCon. Drupal coding standards are very, very important. And what that means is what your white space looks like, um, where, what your syntax looks like and how you format it. And you can set up your editor so it does it for you. For example, I am going to save you about three hours of my time right now by saying .yaml files require two or multiple of two spaces to work, not a tab. If you mess this up, you will have a white screen of death <laughs> and it will take you three hours of Googling to figure out, or at least it did me my first time. So it's very, very important. Now, it's not just what it looks like, but especially now that we're working with YAML files, get your spacing right or you will crash your site. <laughs> Hosting. 
Uh, this is just my list of things that I um, get together for hosting. Find your SSH keys and figure out how they do SSH keys. Why this is so difficult, I don't know, but this always seems to take me forever. Um, and then find out what hosting specific tools you're gonna be using. Um, there are booths here for all of these people, Pantheon, Calibox, Acquia Dev Desktop. They all have their own tools, they all have their own workflows. They have all kinds of wonderful things for you. So I, I suggest, I've worked with all of these. Um, and they do change how your environment is set up. I debated with myself on whether or not I wanted to go through each one of these, um, but honestly, like, Pantheon's gonna do a much better job of pre presenting Pantheon's product than I am. So, um, but just know that this is gonna be something that you'll have to set up and learn the workflow of if you're working on a big project with a number of developers. Um, MAMP WAMP, I really only, uh, <laughs> if you're running your own local environment, uh, you need to set your memory limit very, very high. And the reason for this is for front-end developers, when we turn on Twig debugging, it's going to crash if it is not high enough. Uh, it takes, Twig debugging takes a lot of memory. So um, just please, before you even try to start developing, you're gonna save yourself a lot of time if you go and set your memory limit high. Um, other modules that I go on and I install locally um, just for myself, and you can get ignore these if you don't want to push them up, um, are Devel, 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 Develkin, Stage File Proxy, which um, allows you to pull images from um, a, a live website rather than having to have the files on your local. Uh, for some of my clients, the files are you know, hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes, so it's not realistic for me to have files on my computer. Um, you might want to turn on a style guide so you can see what you're developing uh, really quick. Uh, and then admin toolbar is just something I always turn on. Um, so now we've kind of set up Drupal, and uh, just every single time, again, it's, this is just on my checklist. We're going through the checklist now. This stuff's super boring. You've probably done it once or twice, but here you go. Remember to do this. You gotta change your file permissions. Um, pro tip, I am huge, again, on the command line, uh, and a lot of front-end developers are afraid of things like this, but uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about bash aliases. A bash alias is just, you get to make a little tiny clip, like CDP, and it runs a whole long command for you. Then you don't have to remember it. Later on, you don't have to write it down in documentation. It's already in your aliases file, okay? So if, when I type CDP into my bash shell, it runs this and changes my file permissions for me. So um, uh, another permissions that you need to make sure that you gather is, er and this is again every new client that I get, you need to log into the site, make sure that you have permission as an admin so that you can edit and do things that you need to do as the, on the site and that you are not user one. Who here drush Uli's into their client site as user one? Yeah, we do it, we all do it, okay? Don't do that anymore. <laughs> the reason that I say this is if you have your own user, things are tracked, things are logged, they can't come back and say you did things uh, when you didn't, okay? If you're just drush uli in as user one, it, it becomes really hard to track who's doing what. Um, I'm gonna come back to Bash RC. If you are a front-end developer and you don't know what your Bash RC is, this is your slide, that this is your homework, okay? Go home and find out what your Bash RC is, okay? It's just a little tiny file, and in this file you can make yourself all the shortcuts in the world. Suddenly the command line will be your friend again, okay? <laughs> and this is where my, I remember when the, um, the computer was the command line. These, these are, these are um, pretty straightforward things. They've been around for years. There's lots of documentation. Please go check out your Bash RC. So you can see here, my Bash RC has aliases just to change directories. That's the first one. Go to my htdocs directory. A second alias um, actually goes into Pantheon, downloads a database, and puts it into a file, okay? So I don't have to go to Pantheon and click download the database and then go and put it into the database. And do, do. 
When I want to do, get a database, it's actually two aliases for me, okay? So these are really powerful little tools if you aren't using for the front end. Please go look at these up, see what other people are doing. Uh, the last thing I have here is um, a little, a little uh, bash script that um, the, the one is a parameter, so um, when I type in sgit, then it's gonna search my git branch for all the git branches for uh, whatever my search, whatever I type in after that. So you can write little tiny snippets of code really fast and um, this just, anything, when we talk about, uh, these are your personal front end dev tools that you know that you have to do and you have to go and look up these commands over and over again. Put them in here and then you won't, you won't have to search for them and you won't have to type as much. Okay, Git, I, I debated whether to even put this on here, but um, uh, it's important that you put Git in and more important that you're in your Git ignore, ignore file, you, um, you're ignoring your node modules and we'll talk about why you get a bunch of node modules, but you don't wanna check all that stuff in. Uh, so you do need to create a Git ignore file and ignore your front end files that you do not want to check in for other developers. Um, that's very important. Okay, so that was just our general, like you could use all of that for any site that you're developing, those weren't Drupal. Some of them were Drupal specific, but here's some more specific to Drupal. Um, things that we have to go in and change, we've pulled down our, our local environment, we've pulled down our code, now we need to go and change our settings.php, our services.yaml in order to debug twig. I'm gonna talk a little bit about YAML files. Uh, you need to make sure your dress is up and running and you might wanna use Drupal console. So, um, deep breath. <laughs> uh, who here has edited their settings.php file directly? Yeah, okay, so that's all the back-end developers and some of the front-end developers. You, you really should be making a settings.local.php. Again, then you can put whatever you want in there. You're not gonna step on anybody else's toes. So the settings.php is for generated when you set up Drupal and everyone shares it. You can turn on settings.local, so it'll just point to that. You can put your own settings in there. And then you put your local database, and more importantly for us front-end people, you can disable CSS and JSS aggregation there, so you don't have to go into the GUI and keep turning it off if, <laughs> if that's what you need to do. And then when you pull, it's not gonna turn that off with other people's config either, because now with Drupal 8, we're passing config around as well, right? So, so it's important that you do this here. Um, services.yaml, it works kind of the same way. You can make a services.local.yaml, but make sure you put that in your git ignore file. Um, and uh, you want, you can go through your services, tip, find, grep, uh, this twig debug, you'll just make, you can make just a services.yaml that has just this little code in it, and you'll turn twig debug on, okay? Uh, services.local.yaml, and that way, again, you're not editing the shared file, the services.yaml that everybody's using, you're just doing it for yourself. Um, then in your twig files, once you've done this, again, this is, I'm giving you guys a lot of homework. I'm not going through step by step how to do everything. I figure you can Google just as well as I can, right? <laughs> so a lot of these are like, okay, make sure you do this and, and if you need more help, go Google it. Um, but in your twig files, you'll be able to put these two, um, once you've turned all these things on, you'll be able to put these two uh, commands into your twig files to get more information about what's available in your twig files. Okay. Uh, remember, no development yet. We're just we're just turning on our development tools. Okay. Um, .yaml files are something new in uh, Drupal 8. And who here remembers how many spaces for .yaml files? Five. Two. <laughs> two spaces. Two spaces. Two spaces. No tabs. Two spaces. Or you will break your site. And yeah, I. This, I, I was so frustrated when I figured this out. I was like, you have to be kidding me. I put in an extra space and like, I point the whole site. So, um, <laughs> so this is, you, but most important are your theme.info.yaml is gonna have your regions. And now we have .yaml files that we can pass around things like breakpoints, because now we don't have a GUI for breakpoints. It has to be in a YAML file. Um, and uh, it's most commonly used for images and pictures, but most front-end people are gonna know what their theme.breakpoints.yaml is. Oops, 
we went the wrong way. Um, uh, Theme.libraries.yaml is another really big shift that's happened in Drupal 8 that's really fantastic, okay? You can, um, you can load libraries. Now you're not j loading jQuery globally. You're gonna just have this little YAML file. You can load jQuery that there. You can load any other CSS, JavaScript, source, anything you want in this little YAML file. And here's an example of that. So um, for the global library, it looks like this. If you wanna create a library just for a specific page and load it there, you can, you can um, uh, do it here. But get really, really interested in um, libraries, your libraries.yaml file, because there's a lot of power there. And if you need jQuery, this is where you turn it on. So um, finally, again, Drupal 8 specific uh, Drush. Uh, we're now setting up Drush with Composer. We're doing lots of other things with Composer. So you do need to learn Composer and how to install things with Composer. And so Drush is a nice, a nice intro step into that. Composer is becoming more and more of a part of Drupal 8 installs. Um, and uh, uh, there's also different ways to use multiple versions of Drush. Um, uh, if you look on the Hook42 website, we have a, an article by uh, Jeff uh, about that. Uh, Drupal console, um, I was really Drupal console resistant. I'm command line, but I'm like, really, another one? <laughs> but Drupal console has some really great things for us themers, like GT, generate a theme. So if right there, you just generate your little theme file and all your .yaml files, and it just makes a little folder for you, and this just made me extremely happy. So um, <laughs> go learn Drupal console. It is worth the time. Okay, so this is where I'm gonna make you stand up because we got halfway through. Everybody stand up and stretch. And if you didn't want to, Cassian says you have to. Anyone who gets that joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who thinks I'm talking too fast? No, no one? Okay, that was my, <laughs> the last time I gave this speech, they're like, you did not take a breath. <laughs> so, oh, good. So everybody stretched out. Um, this is K2SO. I love K2SO. He is snarky. <sighs> Just love, he's just me. That's just, this is, if you wanna see my avatar, that's it. Um, all right, so now the probably, this is the part that you guys all came for, okay. So we got through the checklist of all the Drupal 8 stuff. We got through all the like, okay, we did our bash aliases and our settings on PHP and our service, like all that super boring stuff. Now we get into what is really fun for the front end people, okay. So we get into the front end DevOps and this is, um, this is again exploded in the last few years. Uh, maybe two and a half years, three years ago, we were all like, oh, "Grunt, Grunt is out. That's so amazing, you know." And now Grunt is over. Okay, <laughs> Grunt's gone. Uh, I am going to talk about Grunt because you might inherit Grunt because themes, themes do stand around for more than two years. Amazingly enough, um, but this is this is the, the ever changing landscape. And um, I actually had a lot of requests from back-end developers uh, for this part because they would ask me questions like, what is Node.js? <laughs> so some of this for you front-end developers is gonna be uh, you know, stuff you already know and you can correct me later when I make mistakes. But for the back-end developers, um, there's some, some definite information you'll need here. So when I'm setting up my front-end dev environment, um, I'm gonna set up Node.js, NPM, Gulp, version control, SAS, SAS tools. Um, why, and a lot of what we're gonna talk about is task runners, okay? So when we talk about front end, um, whoops, hi K2. Um, when we talk about front end DevOps, uh, we, uh, we are gonna talk a lot about task runners, which is Gulp, Grunt, things that do things for us, kind of like aliases, but on speed. So um, uh, why a task runner? Um, 
Why do we need a task runner? First of all, because we all love this thing called SaaS, right? SaaS is a, a fantastic innovation in what we're doing with CSS that makes it more um, available uh, to, to make larger and larger sites uh, with, you know, crazy things we should have had in CSS earlier on, like, um, and I'm thinking, I can't even think of the right word, but, you know, dollar sign. Somebody help me. <laughs> yeah, variables, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, you get in front of, yeah, there's probably 150 people in here, and I, I get, a little, get a little loopy. Um, so SAS, because of all those variables, it requires compiling and watching. Compiling is an old computer thing, right? Like, we don't compile on the web, but SAS requires compiling and watching. Um, jo now, this is where you get into, you want the better front-end developers. And the better front-end developers are the JavaScript developers. And the JavaScript developers like to lint, concat, and uglify everything. This is very different than, again, other things that we have on the web. But we want to do this, and we want to do it right now. And we, um, we like our gulp for doing that. Um, there's also some very big advantages to time. Live reload, for example, if you change your CSS, it just reloads your browser for you so you don't have to go over and click Reload, reload, reload each time you make a small change, okay? A task runner is going to do that for you. Um, a KSS style guide, this is a, an alternative to things like Pattern Lab that's, that um, comes out and it requires a task runner. Uh, regression testing you can do with a task runner. So it's et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. Each front end developer has this list of repetitive tasks that we want to do, um, and so we need a task runner, okay? But before we can have a task runner, we have to install this thing called Node.js. What is Node.js? And I get asked this by more back-end developers who, who don't do JavaScript but do PHP, right? This is a huge framework. Node.js is huge. It's not just for front-end. Whole applications are written in Node.js, okay? Node.js is a, is a whole other way to write web applications, or actually applications for all kinds of things. I shouldn't say web. Um, but for us, for us front-end Drupal developers, we just install it because we want to install Node packages with it. So people are writing these little applications in Node.js. We want to install those applications to do our, our busy tasks for us. So that's what Node.js is. It's a huge framework. We install it so that we can use um, Node packages with the N NPM. Some of the more advanced front-end developers are, are, of course, going to go and write their own uh, node packages, but that's, we're not, we're talking Drupal sphere here right now. <laughs> this is, this is what we do it for. Um, NPM stands for Node Package Manager. So we just want these little applications to pull in so that we can run all these repetitive tasks that we want in the background. Um, and it's a large repository of online Node.js projects. There's thousands and thousands and thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of these. And we use these to automate our front-end processes. Um, they're installed as part of Node.js. So we install Node.js so we can use Node Package Manager and run the nodes. Um, NPM and Gulp. So we've installed Node.js. We've, install we, we've said, OK, as part of Node.js, I now have Node Package Manager. And now I'm going to use Gulp, which is the actual task runner. Um, and it helps us automate tasks like watching SAS, which we talked about before, linting files, concatenating files, um, all those little things that JavaScript developers <laughs> like to do to make things really, really small. Smallness is a thing in JavaScript, you know. There's a whole community of people that are like, I wrote an entire application in 15 characters. You know, this is like, <laughs> we like this. We like tiny, tiny, tiny. So, um, and we can add uh, to our Gulp abilities by installing NPM gulp packages. Uh, you can also use NPM as your task runner, and this is becoming more common. I'm not going to talk about that, that now because um, it's more common, but it's also a little bit more complicated because the advantage of gulp is that it's easy to read. Front-end developers can do it really fast. Uh, the NPM's a little bit more installed. So to install gulp, here we, I just put this up here. Because you see, now I've installed Node. Now all I have to type is npm install dash dash save dev gulp, and then run npm install, and I'll have gulp on my machine, and it's ready to go, and I can start using all these fancy little tools. Um, and all of them are the same way. 
right? Install gulp sass, and install cat, concat, and lint, uglify, all these things, all those things I said before, there's all these little NPM packages that we install. Um, because we're installing these little applications from somewhere else, it's important that we have version controlling. Um, because when you're working on a great big team, one person might have one version of Node.js, another has another version of Node.js, another has a version of SAS, another has a, and the, the outcome of your compiling is gonna be different, okay? So we need version control for which application we're using of all these millions and thousands of NPM applications. Because the guys who are working on them and the women are, are updating it all the time. Uh, so you need this so that different developers are using the same versions of NPM and Gold Tests per project, okay? So on my machine, I might be using SAS 3.0 over here and SAS 2.0 over here and, and you know, node this over here and NPM that over there. So you need to have some version control so that when you go into the project, you're using the right version of all these little things. Um, and so the same machine might have two versions of Node.js or plugins and it uses the right one at the right time. Um, and some types of version control are shrink wrap, Bower. At the end of this presentation, I have um, a link to a great article, again, I, uh, um, Jeff at uh, Hook42 wrote, that uh, goes into how to really do this right, but it, I could give a 50 minute talk on this, so. But just know that you need to do this if you're working on a large team, you need to have version control. If it's just you, you can have your own task runner and be all cowboy and that's fine. But <laughs> if you're on a large team, which most of us are these days, you need that. So what can Gulp do? We've talked a little bit about this, but SAS, Lint.js, uh, ESLint, um, which cleans up your code for you, Concat, Uglify, which makes it really, really small. The JavaScript developer is like really, really small. Um, live Reload, which is gonna reload our browsers so that we're not, <laughs> oh, I changed red, reload. I changed the padding, reload. No, it's just you change the padding and it, it's gonna work over here and just reload it for you. That's, that's such a time saver. Um, it can run Drush tasks. It can clear the cache for you. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, <laughs> this is like, wow, Drupal and Gulp all work together. Um, and it does any repetitive tasks, browser sync, libraries. It can load libraries. Like if you don't wanna load the library through the, the Drupal 8 for some reason, you could load libraries. Gulp does all kinds of things. So here's an example of a gulp file. Um, at the top, we just require uh, the, the um, little gulp task that we want, and then we give it some um, different, uh, uh, and I'm, that, okay, everybody, what do we give it? We give it, not variables, and this, parameters, thank you. <laughs> um, and then we're gonna um, make a little function that that when we type gulp watch in this case, the first word is uh, the function we're gonna say, um, it's going to run those things for us. Grunt, so I mentioned grunt, grunt is over. Like we're not doing grunt anymore, that's so over, that's so three years ago. Um, but you might inherit a project that has grunt on it and it's almost exactly the same thing. You'll see that the syntax is different, it's using a little bit of a different thing, but it's doing the same thing. You're loading them and then you're watching and, and uh, Anybody who's a programmer can read these pretty easily and, and follow along. Ruby and SAS is another way. So Compass, Ruby uh, was another way. You might inherit a, a project that has that. And, um, and so you'll have to install Ruby in order to use their SAS. Um, and then there's a thing for that, for version managing again, called Ruby Version Manager. Um, I mention it just because you might run into these things, okay? These are all the different ways that we've done it over the last uh, few years. Gulp pretty much is one now, so if you're starting from scratch, use Gulp, uh, but uh, there you might run into these other things. Um, <sighs> SAS versus less. Um, SAS and less, so who here has done a less project? Has anybody in here done a less project? Who's done a less project in the last six months? Yeah, so it's fewer, okay? So less, again, less has its place, um, but they're both CSS preprocessors. I've talked a lot about SAS because SAS really is the direction that we're going. Um, and why do we even use these? Um, and I'm, again, this part is for you back-end developers like, who are like, what is SAS and why? Front-end developers, just five minutes here. Um, 
we have cleaner code with reusable pieces and variables, which we just didn't have before. Um, it saves us time. It's easier to maintain later on. Um, it's often very annoying for backend developers because they have to also learn how to use all these task runners and compile things the way that we are doing, okay? So front-end developers have some, some mercy on your back-end developers because they don't necessarily see this list the way we do. Um, but suddenly, wow, we can have calculations and logic. <gasps> it's magic! Um, and we're more organized and easier to set up. So SAS, SAS or less? Who, who prefers SAS? Who prefers less? Okay, you're wrong. <laughs> Unless less is your thing. I seriously, like, I'm, I'm totally gonna, but, but if you're starting a new project now, it's SAS, okay? Please use SAS, okay? Um, Unless less is your thing, and uh, seriously, if it's your thing, it's your thing, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna come check your code. Um, so, so now we've talked about just task runners. We've just talked about uh, Node.js and npm and all these little gulp tasks that we can do. But there's also tools just for SAS, right? Like you don't necessarily have to use gulp to use these tools, although I suggest that you do. Um, and so we have uh, things like Compass, which um, sort of lets you uh, uh, have more robust CSS. Um, Bourbon, SUSE is a, uh, Bourbon and SUSE are grids. Uh, Breakpoint, which um, uh, again works with your SAS tools to give you uh, reusable breakpoints. Modular scale is a, a topography um, thing and Tippy is a topography thing. But these are all the things that front end people, um, uh, we're starting to use more and more. And this list is gonna be like the grunt, okay? This list changes. I didn't even bother to go through all of this too much. Take a picture, use these right now. They're gonna change in three months, what everybody's using, because we're going fast on the front end and we're changing things up and the way things get used uh, changes. Like I prefer SUSE right now, but you know, three months from now, it might be something else. Um, so that was the end of the, uh, the third part, which is kind of your, your SAS, your NPM, your Node.js, that sort of set of the world. Um, but now um, we're, those of us who are working on very, very large projects um, are starting to talk about how, no, about how we organize our CSS, okay, our SAS. Um, because this is becoming more and more important. How do I find things? How do I change things? Um, so this, this is actually where I spend um, a lot of my time thinking and working right now. Um, and the checklist for this section is, how are my twig files set up? Where are my twig files? What's my component file structure? What are some SAS, what SAS structure am I going to use or am I going to combine them or am I gonna use a different one? Um, are we gonna use Pattern Lab and Atomic Design? That's another one. So um, are we gonna do JavaScript and decouple Drupal? Where's my REST API, okay? So this is, a, this is the kind of the new um, thing that we're all talking about and I know you front enders are just sitting there going, I have my way that I like to do it and I wanna talk about it because <laughs> this is where the real interesting stuff's going on right now. So. Twig file structure in Drupal 8, okay? Classy is set up and nicely organized. So thank you, Martin, for that. Yay! Um, so when you go into core and you see Classy, this is your theme structure. But as you'll notice, this, this theme structure is really very Drupal-y, okay? It's a very Drupal theme structure. So if you have to go in and find your Twig templates, it's really Drupal-y, right? Field, data set, form, layout. This is, this is very Drupal-centric. But where we're going on the front end is more um, of a component file structure, okay? And we're gonna talk about Pattern Lab and Atomic Design in just a second. But um, sometimes Twig's files are in components. So we're gonna look at Zen for D8. This is where things are going. Because um, instead of organizing them by file type like we had before with the classy, right, uh, where we have all the content in one and the fields in one and the views in one, that's very Drupal-y, right? That's not a component-based structure. We want to have components. So what's a component? For example, in Zen, the footer is a component. And you see, this is a very different file structure. In the footer, we have the JSON, the, um, 
the SAS and the Twig all together in one folder. Before, we used to have all the SAS in one folder, all the Twig in one folder, all the JavaScript in one folder. They were kind of away from each other. But now we're starting to group things together based on their functionality and their component. Why do this? Because if you need to change something in the footer, you're probably gonna need to change the JavaScript and the Twig file and the SAS. It's revolutionary. We can find them all in one place. We don't have to go around and find the three things and they're named something different. And because uh, naming gets naming's hard. Okay, so this is where things are going. And uh, thank you for to Tom, who's working on the Zen theme, for showing us the way. So within this, okay. So now we know we want things kind of componentized, right? Okay. So that's one idea, um, but. We also just have all these selectors and they're all over the place. Um, and SAS is getting bigger and bigger, so we're trying to get organized. So we have um, three main types of SAS structures that are predominant today. There are other ones and we're gonna, I would love to hear if you have a new way of doing it. This is, I, I love talking about this stuff. So, um, so we have SMACs, which organizes folders and directors generally. We're gonna look at what SMACs is. Uh, BEM, block element modifier, which is generally how you name your classes. I say generally because I already showed you a file structure and these have different uh, folder structures. Uh, so you're, you might be taking and borrowing from all of these different things and not, some people are like all oh, smacks, 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 smacks. Some people use smacks and BEM. Some people use smacks and BEMs and OS, oh, object oriented CSS. So there's, there's, um, there's, these are three main ways of thinking about it, but um, you don't have to use just one. So a SMACS example is this. Um, SMACS, as you see, uh, it, it, um, it uh, uh, defines things as like layout, um, then, then colors and classes, and it has a very specific uh, naming structure. Um, Block element modifier, a lot of people like this because it's a little bit easier to remember. The block is the nav, the element is the list or the link, and the modifier is active or not active, right? So it's a, it's a pretty, once you, it's a much more human readable kind of way to do things. Um, object oriented CSS, as you see here, is the idea that we are separating layout and uh, so the first three like button, box, and widget all have layouts, widths, heights, and then skin defines the look and the feel of something. So in object-oriented CSS, we get many, many classes um, that all, that you add many different classes to one, um, one element in the DOM uh, to do that. So these are the three big, and I, I really encourage you to go out and look, the, all of these have websites, all of them, um, have different ways of doing things, and you're gonna start seeing these more and more in themes as you go on. Um, there's also a big push right now um, for Pattern Lab and Atomic Design. Has anybody in here done a Pattern Lab site yet? Okay, we have a couple, yeah. Um, Pattern Lab is, uh, it's, it was worth mentioning on its own uh, because it's an application, I call it application in quotes, okay, that creates a very nifty style guide. Um, and it's based on atomic design. And this again, like I was saying, we're moving to component-based things. Here's where we get even more component-based. So in atomic design, you start even smaller. So you have things over here like little buttons, and then, which are atoms, and then the buttons all go together to make a, a bar, which is a molecule, and then the bar goes together to make a full thing, which is an organism, and then it makes kind of a template and then a page. So you're going from this really small thing to this big thing. It's, a, it's again a shift in how we're organizing, how we're thinking, how we're developing. And the front end is no longer your JavaScript's all here, your CSS is all here. We're going more into each little component being something that we can modify on its own. Also, Pattern Lab, gives you this style guide, which is pretty awesome if you've worked with it. Uh, you can set your styles in here, and um, it will sh show you the HTML and the twig in order to have the styles, and everything is clicky clicky and easy for your client, and your client goes, ooh, and you didn't do anything, right? So 
well, you had to get Pattern Lab to work with Drupal, which was its own feat. But, <laughs> but this is a wow factor, and this is something I think we're going to see coming up more in the front end. We're less on the like theme based, um, and more on the we're going to start plugging in our own little applications that help us uh, organize and modify where we're going. Um, so JavaScript and decoupled Drupal, um, these live outside of your theme. Okay, if you've ever worked with decoupled Drupal, it's important to note this is nowhere in your theme. These are their own things. They have their own file structures. If you're using React, Angular, Ember, does anybody see a pattern here? Ember, view, yeah. <laughs> These again, I don't go over any one of these. React is the winner right now. I can guarantee you three months from now, there is gonna be a completely new decoupled front end awesomeness that we're, we haven't even heard of yet, right? Uh, j JavaScript developers are just going crazy with this right now. So, um, but if you are doing a decoupled theme, these are gonna live outside of your theme. Like you might put it in the theme folder, but it needs to have its own structure. And this really isn't part of your theme. If you run into a site where you inherit one of these, it's not your theme, it's its own thing, okay? Um, so this is where I quote myself, which is controversial. Um, but this is where I, I said, you know, we're talking about these things and I get in arguments <laughs> with other front-end developers all the time about BIM or Smacks or Pattern Lab or da da da. But more important than all of that, okay, more important than which one you choose is that you tell me which one you chose in the README file, okay? You may not own this uh, theme forever. You may not own this Drupal site forever. If you could just please put in a README read me that says, you know, I kind of used BEM, but seriously, I kind of used Smacks, and then the client really wanted me to use fruit terms, so everything's rutabaga and orange and, you know, and, and that gives your, your next developer some help, okay? But think about who, um, who else is gonna inherit this, because I've inherited a lot of crazy sites. Um, other things that you want in your dev environment, if you're gonna take a picture of one, take a picture of this one. Slack, there's a Drupal twig where you can go and talk to people like me and say, why the heck isn't my twig working? <laughs> it's a Slack channel that anybody can join, okay? Come hang out with us on Slack, all right? Um, I also use Xcode for an iPhone simulator. I cannot tell you how awesome it is. Just it's worth downloading Xcode for an iPhone simulator. You can run all the sauce labs and whatever you want, but um, being able to go in and, and poke at it right there uh, while you're developing is, is great. Um, browser plugins like Live Reload. Yes, you still need Photoshop and Illustrator. Uh, you know, those of you who use open source, uh, they're nice too, but if you can get your boss to pay for Photoshop and Illustrator, get it. Um, ticketing systems like Jira and Zoho, yes, as a friend and developer, you are gonna need to learn to use those. And then bookmarks. <laughs> Again, my aliases and my bookmarks are always the things that people are like, you're so fast. I'm, you know, so, so cool. So that's it for setting up a friend and DevOps. Please join us for contrib contribution sprints, even if you haven't before. Um, it's really easy to get involved with Drupal. Um, if you would like to uh, comment on this at all, this is, these are the surveys. And so long, and thanks for all the fish, you guys. <laughs> there, there's a microphone if you want to ask questions. Hi. Hi. Uh, I just want to commend you. That was actually a really great overview, getting in depth um, of, of all the different components oh, thank you. that kind of laid out <laughs> um, a Drupal 8 theme. And I also wanted to invite anybody that wanted to take it maybe a little bit deeper. We're having a boff tomorrow at 1 o'clock. It's called um, Drupal Theming Patterns. Oh, cool. And so please join us just to discuss this kind of topic. It's great. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> That's a boff. Hello, hi. I'm a back-end developer, long-time back-end developer. All right. uh, but I have some experience with front-end. Way back in the day, I was focused on cross-browser design and all that stuff, so I understand a lot about what you talk about. Great talk, by the way. Thank My you. question is, what is your preference for, the, out of the different CSS structures, what is your preference right now? Oh, I'm definitely, uh, like, if you're going to do one thing, do components. 
uh, start thinking in component structures and, and uh, pattern lab and atomic design. Not necessarily using pattern lab and atomic design, but start thinking in that way. Yeah. Thanks. What is your opinion on using the Xcode simulator for the iPhone versus using the Safari plugin that allows for you to debug directly in the iPhone? That, that's a great question. Um, the Xcode uh, simulator, yeah. it simulates a little bit better touch and your touch, your swipes and things like that. Okay. Um, the Safari one uh, does a great job for like a first pass. But I have a client who is very, very specific about iPhone products in general. And um, the, the iPhone simulator is like having an iPhone. And, okay. and um, the, whereas the, the Firefox one is pretty darn close, but there's a difference. Well, no, yeah. I, in Safari, you can plug your iPhone into your computer and oh, you can debug. Oh, yeah, go ahead and do that if, okay. you, if you have the ability to okay. do that. Yes, <laughs> yes, it, the, the, the idea, for me, I just, I can't be bothered. <laughs> So the X code is right on my it's, yeah, that makes uh, my sense. screen. That makes, that makes Thank perfect. you. Right. <laughs> I also don't have an iPhone. So. Hi. Uh, Hi. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks. So I hope you didn't think you would get away with it, right? Less versus SAS. <laughs> oh, I knew it. I so knew it. Uh, yeah, no. I am one of those less guys. <laughs> yeah. And I would like you to convince me to go to SAS, which I do, but less than less. So <laughs> could you give me two pros for SAS and two cons for less? Yeah, they're Thank kind you. of the same thing though. Um, the, the SAS community is bigger and people are developing tools for it is the, is the number one reason to go SAS. Um, less, I think less is, is equitable to SAS in a lot of ways. But SAS has more tools and more plugins because there are more people using it. So I don't, for a smaller site, less is fantastic. I, I actually really enjoy less. I think it's a good thing, but it's going to continue to fall behind uh, because there aren't the same number of developers making tools for it. So it's not, it's not that I think um, SAS versus less is inherently better. It's just that that's what the community has decided. Yeah. Yeah. So. I saw that Bootstrap 4 is now moving to SAS. Isn't yeah. It? They and still provide less, but now it's written in SAS. So. Yeah, and they've they've kind of come to the same the same conclusion that they can get more developers to help them, you know, create things like Sissy and and breakpoints and, and the other things that we want to plug into these, into SAS or into our, our um, preprocessor. Uh, we don't want to fall behind um, in the tools that we're developing. And, and less, you know, they're just, it's kind of like Grunt. They were the same, but now people just have chosen SAS. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Um, hello. Um, my question was basically just about um, when you're organizing your SAS files and you say you're using something like Bourbon, um, yeah. some of the companies I've worked with, they, when they have their SAS files, what they'll do is they'll set up their breakpoints in one file, then their desktop files in one file. Um, can you talk about what's, kind of, what's the better format Would to organize your breakpoint, to organize your files out in different types, or have it like one big... Um, file that you would use for um, all your breakpoints and everything else in it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So um, when I develop, um, and, and this is pretty common now, uh, you put the breakpoints per selector. So okay. you don't put all of your, um, you don't put all of your, uh, let's say your large or your desktop uh, CSS together. Because when we're developing, again, we're going more towards components, right? So if you think about what you're doing, like let's say we want to modify a button, right? We want to know um, what that button looks like at every stage. We don't necessarily want to know what the whole thing looks like at this stage or that stage. We're, we're as developers, we really are looking at 90% of the time at a button, right? So that's why you put your, you put your, you make a global breakpoints, you reference those breakpoints mm. per selector. Um, and that, it, it does add a little bit more um, CSS. Yeah, and, that's, but and that was the, because that's the thing I was having with my team. I was telling them, 
the I'm kind of new to the team, and they're used to doing it a certain way, and explain to them the saying, well, look, if you're looking at a button, you have just different buttons in maybe mobile style or maybe in a desktop format. So if you use something like Bourbon, where you can just bring in your mobile breakpoints and do it all one there, the file size will be bigger. But even though the file size is bigger, it makes it easier to maintain the code overall. Yeah. Because now your developers don't have to go back in three or four different files and look for those. All they have to do is look at that one button and it's there. But, so I yeah. just wanted to kind of talk about and that. that. And that's a, that's a design pattern that's, again, probably, like you said, they're used to doing it that way. Okay. Because, again, three years ago, we didn't know which way was the best way, right? right. So they chose one. And I, I actually have a site that I had to, I had to yank yeah, some stuff out. Yeah, and I've done that, out. exactly. Yeah. And that's a pain, so I'm super sorry. But um, <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, uh, but but yeah, that's that's uh, you're absolutely right that the direction that we're going now is component based and and show on Pattern Lab and Atomic Design uh, because that that's where the community is going. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually that's a good segue into uh, my question. So, uh, how are you hooking up Pattern Lab with Drupal? Oh, yeah, it, there's some work that goes into it. I personally am not working on this at my company right now, but we are implementing it for uh, UCSF. Uh, it should come out in a couple of months, and you can go into that. That will be open source. You can go in and see how they did it, okay? Cool, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so I'm wondering, you talk a lot about how fast this is moving. I mean, just the trends yes. and everything. How do you keep track of it? Like how, I'm like, I'm a director. I'm, I'm not a front end <laughs> developer. I need to know whether my team is going in the right direction or just I want to keep in touch with the trends. How, how can I do that? What, what's the best sources out there? Well, this is, again, not popular amongst front end people, but I'm going to say uh, it's just a theme. So whatever they are comfortable in and yeah. whatever your team has ability in is yeah. what you should choose. So um, I would question them, like, is that the best thing, really? Uh -huh. but, but ultimately, they're going to decide what they feel comfortable with. You're going to be faster and more organized because of it. If you start pushing them into um, uh, adopting something, that here's, the, here's the, the nice side. If you push them into adopting something, that something's going to be gone in three months, too, right? So. Yeah. Whatever they're comfortable with, you know, and then when you go to re redo your site two or three years later, you're going to start over from scratch with anyways. something new. Anyway, okay, yeah. got it. Thanks. Hi there. This actually piggybacks off of that question, but an informal poll to the room: If you guys are using a grid system, is it Singularity? Is it Suzy? Is it Bourbon? What are you guys using right now? Oh, I forgot about Singularity. <laughs> yes, I saw that. Yes. I'm just so. Many uh, Susie is definitely taking the lead, okay. um, but Singularity is very popular. I, I looked at Bourbon, I'm like, oh, I don't think anybody uses it. Oh, well, maybe nobody will notice when <laughs> I put that on there. Right. So Susie, if you have to choose. Okay, but, yeah. fair enough. But I don't know, ask I everybody. I was going to say, what, what does the room say, if you guys are? Do you guys have a, a who's for Susie? Anybody? Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hey. I tried to find your slides online. I couldn't. So can oh, you, you put couldn't. Okay. Yeah. These I'll slides. Put it, I'll put it back up. Yeah. Thank you. You probably spelled Kristen wrong because it's got a good. No. Copy spell. paste. No. I don't know. <laughs> I found your site. But there you go. Thank you. They're, they're also on the uh, website on the session in the comments. I put a link oh, to it okay. in the comments. Thank you. Appreciate you're, it. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay. Thank you guys.